in thinking about images and the connection between images and the unknown and the ability of images to, to draw the unknown out, I thought about this quote from Simon Shama from Landscape and Memory. Before it can ever be a repose for the senses, landscape is the work of the mind. Its scenery is built up as much from strata of memory as from layers of rock. And I begin to ask myself, what if the memory has been stripped from the landscape? You know, what would be left? Can that memory be restored? And what relationship does that restored memory then have to the images? Much of the work that I've done over the past, since 1997, interviewing survivors, uh, liberators, and eyewitnesses of the Nazi concentration camps in Upper Austria has been uh, about a landscape which, by and large, has been overlooked. And in fact, what I learned is that if the memory has been stripped from the landscape, in fact, some of the elements of the landscape disappear. This is the most iconic photograph of the Mauthausen camp. This is the stairs of death uh, up which prisoners had to march from the Wiener Graben quarry to the um, Mauthausen camp. Very few people know that there were also quarries at the associated with the Gusen camps, uh, less than two and a half miles away. There is no photograph that is w as well known about these camps, even though they were larger than the Mauthausen camp, with, uh, with the exception of uh, one year. Now, um, another element of the landscape that is relatively unknown to this day is, uh, are the Birkerstall tunnels um, near St. Jorgen under Gusen, which were built by slave labor from concentration camp Gusen II. This is a photograph that was given to the Gusen Memorial Committee by Major Sandler, who, who was in charge of the concentration camp and up this area for a while after the liberation. This is an element of the landscape that, that is not well known. This is the liberation of Mauthausen, as many people see it, a very organized affair in interviewing some of the liberators of the camp, the relationship between this scene and the liberation becomes clear. In 1998, I interviewed John Slatton, who lived in Alabama, um, and uh, he was one of the liberators on May 5th of this concentration camp. And he's going to describe this photograph, uh, which was actually taken May 6th. This was the next day. They staged May 6th, that picture yeah. for the photographers. Mm -hmm. So they asked us to bring that vehicle in, and, they, and there we were. And I, this fellow was driving the armored car, he's an eager an armored car driver, he was a jeep driver. Really? What's yeah, his uh, name? Uh, Edward Zarnowski. Mm -hmm. And this fellow here, his name was Bill Pickett, out in, in Bowdoin, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. He was a corporal in the scout section. This mm -hmm. fellow here is Jerry Rosenthal, I mentioned him mm -hmm. a few minutes ago. He was a radio operator at another armored car. And then there's myself, I uh -huh. was a radio operator gunner in this car. Amazing. And, so, and I was, again, I was sitting outside there uh -huh. on the guns, because you can't leave one of those things on man. Uh -huh. And Bill Pickett comes running out there and says, call it Al, and says, Al says, bring the armored car around and bring it in the gate. They want to make pictures. And so I said, well, get me a drive. <laughs> so that, that's the reason the four of us were on it. <laughs> this is the next day. So on May 6th, this scene is staged at Mount Housen, but in fact, the liberation of Goose and One and Two resulted in, in uh, the deaths of hundreds of prisoners um, through revenge, through conflict between different ethnic groups, different nations. And one of the reasons I think that the uh, Cohen report does not represent all the nationalities that were at Mount Housen and Goose and over 31 nationalities, is actually because the uh, committee, the prisoners committee, which organized this banner and which uh, was involved in staging this representation, actually recommended to the war crimes investigators who should be interviewed. In fact, the war crimes investigation files that we have are only in Yiddish, French, Spanish, Czech, English, and German. The other possibility, I have to say that, that those nationalities are very well represented on that committee. The other possibility is simply that the war crimes investigators did not know Hungarian or Polish because those languages are, un, are not represented in the war crimes, uh, inter, war crimes interviews from survivors. 
This is the Goosen Memorial, which was built in the early 1960s by survivor organizations. And an important fact about this memorial was that it was supported by survivors until 1997 when it was given to the Austrian federal government, which meant that the collection of memory about this landscape was separated from the official history of the camps, which was maintained at Mauthausen. It's only two and a half miles away, but the separation is illustrated by the fact that Paul Yasket, in researching the architecture of oppression, did not find any information about the Gusen quarries at the uh, Mauthausen Museum. He used SS documents that he got from the Bundesarchiv to find the Gusen quarries. So SS documents were at that point def still defining this landscape for historians. Another reason why this is so complicated to understand this landscape is all of the uh, railway lines, rivers, and elements that were brought to it. And this is a, a map that my uh, colleague Siki Pizzani drew for me when we were trying to translate the original article that we expanded to make into uh, our book on the Gusen concentration camps. And you can see just how complicated this is. Siggy wrote, oh god, any foreigner uh, must be at a loss. Uh, good luck. So it's very difficult landscape to understand, even after you visited there several times and walked around it. This is uh, the first Gusen commemoration in 1995. The Gusen Memorial Committee started in 1985, became Rudy Hanschmi uh, and Martha Gommer became acquainted with survivors. They began to do research in Austria about the concentration camps, and uh, Rudy published an article about them, the article that we translated. Now, what was important about this event was the addition to the uh, research that we're doing of the liberators who, had, who came back for this anniversary. John Slatton was here at this anniversary. So now we have a connection and a dialogue between liberators, survivors, and eyewitnesses in the towns. One of the things that we learned from the addition of Ray Book's voice, who, was, uh, who drove the bulldozer that buried the bodies, um, was a, he explained a discrepancy between the number of bodies that were presented, that were buried according to the 11th Armored Division documents, and the number that the liberators say that they found. Um, I asked him, why did the documents put those bodies in the hundreds, and yet the liberators talk about burying thousands? About 500 in each heap. People didn't realize how thin they were and how you could pack. How many people? Bones together, like, like the pens here. So if they were now people, theoretically, which are two and three times the size, you'd have a big ball of people in it. And where now they're skin, down to skin and bones, you, you, you pile them up and you never know how many are in the pile. One wagon load had 200 bodies in it. So another important piece of information that we pieced together about the landscape, once we had the memory to uh, explain it and the memory to actually help us to see elements, I actually found some personalities that were hidden in the signal core tapes of these camps. This is a picture, when you first look at it, it appears to be simply citizens, residents from around the area who the 11th Armored Division asked to come and help bury the dead. Actually, one of them happens to be a member of the SS. This is, this is Joseph Lotzel, who was a, a foreman in the quarries. And um, you can see that after the liberation, he certainly wasn't wearing his SS un uniform. And in fact, he was trying to blend in with the local population. So there's a way in which looking at these Signal Corps photographs uh, with the memory of the liberators actually brings out elements that seem to have been unknown. This is the, one of the entrances to the Berkerswell Tunnel in, as it appeared in 1990. What happened is, uh, as time went on, was that it began to be stripped away from the landscape. This is the entrance as it appears today. When you think of those huge uh, concrete reinforced tunnels 
the which trains would go in. This hardly seems to be the same tunnel system. This entrance doesn't seem to be associated with those entrances at all. Um, because local people and survivors have taken efforts to maintain this landscape, it has not been able to be erased. In 2004, the efforts of the survivors, liberators, and the Goosen Memorial Committee resulted in a, an opening of the visitor center at Goosen. One of the problems at the commemorations is uh, that if it rains, there's nowhere to go inside, and there's nowhere for people to gather except for the parish house you know, for seminars or for lectures. So the, uh, the Federal Ministry of the Interior built this visitor center. Unfortunately, um, as you can see, there's a big hole in it because they, they wanted to maintain some of the artifacts of the camp and so there's a, there's a large hole in the middle of this building, which means that there is still no place to gather, uh, no place for memories to be shared because of the, the fact that, you, that there's this um, barrier and this hole in it. This is unfortunate because a lot of the Jewish survivors are not willing, and one can understand it, to go to the parish hall for events at, at a commemoration. In some ways, after the visitor center was opened, the Federal Ministry of the Interior and the Austrian government felt that it had done what it needed to do. It had built a visitor center. After that year, we began to see some interesting ways to try to redefine the landscape. This is the plan by the Federal Real Estate Company to rename the Kellerbau tunnel system as a, an air raid shelter. Um, this is so ironic that they should do this. The, this tunnel system was, of course, an air raid shelter, but not for human beings, for the construction of armaments. Um, the, the international community protested this, and the plan was dropped. This is 1999. The tunnel systems were being filled in, in so that houses could be built above them. And uh, this, was, this also was a, a concern to survivors and to uh, liberators and local people because uh, we were afraid that if the tunnels were filled in, this landscape would simply become a housing district and all memory of the Burgersthal tunnels were erased. Fortunately, we were able to um, stop that and a section of the tunnel is going to be open now to the public. In 2000, David Fisher, an Israeli filmmaker, discovered the diary that his father had written. His father is a Gusen survivor. And as a result of that, he decided to make a film about his family's experience as second generation survivors and visit the Mauthausen Goosen area. Now, I haven't seen the film yet, but this is a picture of David Fisher and his brothers talking to my co-author, Rudy Hounschmied, about the camps. And so now we see second generation survivors coming to the landscape and uh, helping to establish it, really helping to understand the experience through memories and through dialogue. And this is uh, the Fisher brothers, um, his sister, and the film crew. Now, I haven't, as I said, I haven't seen this film, but um, th this is uh, the Fishers walking through the community that is now Goosen, wearing uh, the headphones for the audio bag or the visitor's walk, where they are directed to stop at certain places. The uh, artist Christoph Meyer uh, created this as a way to bring memories to the landscape and, and a way to define the landscape and its history. This is the Fishers and, uh, and other visitors actually in the Burgestall Tunnel. This is very exciting for those of us who really wanted to keep these tunnels open in order for this to happen for second generation survivors, for historians, and for uh, people to come to, to, to see this. The result is uh, Fisher's film, Six Million and One, which again, I haven't seen, but I'm excited about the prospect of many generations now coming and helping to uh, bring memories and to redefine this landscape, which was almost lost to, to a narrative which didn't include it. Thank you.